Honeycomb provides observability for all software engineering teams to learn, debug, and improve production systems to delight end users and eliminate toil. With Honeycomb, developers code with confidence, operator efficiency goes up, life quality improves, and the business grows. I am so excited for our guest today, Charity Majors, co-founder of Honeycomb. Charity, it's so great to have you here today. You wrote a post for us just last week on test-driven development, and it's another opportunity today to discuss test-driven development as a discipline and why it has to become part of the process that's built into the muscle. I like what you say about that and just making it part of what a developer does. So thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. What a beautiful living room you have. <laughs> oh, thank you. We just had a lot of work put into it and it's- uh, Good it's, timing. It's, Yes, it's the, the set that uh, makes uh, the pandemic, I guess, bearable to some extent for uh, video purposes. And Eddie helped us out with it entirely remotely. Wow. And so uh, we've become our own AV technicians here, as a lot of people have. And I actually like your sound screen there. Oh, yes. This is how we create multiple rooms in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no. I, I was, I've been reading um, Understanding Media by Marshall McLuhan. He talks mm. a lot about spaces and how they're defined by media. And I think we're living in that uh, reality right now. So true. I, we're all learning a little bit more about each other than we really needed to. Yeah, <laughs> but it's good. Spaces. <laughs> so I wanted to start with a question about test-driven development mm -hmm. and what is test-driven, what is a test-driven approach today? And I looked back at what Martin Fowler wrote back in 2005. And as you well know, test-driven development dates back much longer than that. Yeah. And he wrote that you write a test for the next bit of functionality you want to add, write the functional code until the test passes, refactor both new and old cold code to make it well-structured. And my question is, has this process fundamentally changed and how so or how not? Yeah, well, it hasn't and that's the problem. I mean, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. That's how you write code, but it's not how you make sure the code works. It's <laughs> it's step one. It makes it it's it tells you that your logic works, which is great. It produces an output, but when it comes to like running systems in production and making sure that an ever larger code base actually like how many things do you have to consider besides whether does it return the right function? It's how quickly does it run? Maybe you've got concurrency issues. You've got thousands of threads running at the same time, all executing, all sharing resources, all sharing information, all hitting the same data storage systems, like it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that that is just the beginning. <laughs> That's just the beginning of your code's life cycle. And so like TDD is brilliant because it allows you to abstract away all the messy reality of production and just focus on getting this function working. But it has almost nothing to say about that function embedded within the code base, embedded within reality as your users are using it. Those are just very different worlds. Mm hmm They are very different worlds. So you write that TDD, you know, has some great things going for it. It's a pure way of thinking about your software. But that's part of the problem too. It's very pure, isn't it? It's very pure. You write about how it's almost hermetically sealed. It is. It, it ends at the border of your laptop. That's your world, right? Which is great if you are, you know, trying to cart your laptop around and write some code and get something pushed to production. But like part of it, I feel like people look at DevOps like it's a new thing. And I really do not. I look at it as tearing down the wall that should never have been built, right? Like returning to our roots as people who built and owned our software 
in production where you know back then you were your your needs and your 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 like reality was very aligned with your user. When your user was yelling at you, <laughs> you fixed the problem, right? It was a very tight, virtuous feedback loop. And, you know, for reasons due to maturity and size and everything, like we've developed all these subspecialties. Um, but the more detached we get from each other, if you've got someone writing the code, like handing it over to release engineering, chipping it off to ops, like you really risk breaking down that virtual cycle. So you're completely detached from your user's experience and you're not actually, you don't have your eye fixed on the biggest problem from their perspective. I heard a technologist once say that one of the biggest mistakes he ever saw was in was infrastructure was actually divided into compute networking and storage. And that, uh, and, and I kind of think that kind of almost refers to what you're saying here a little bit. Yeah, like a specialization is necessary for scaling reads, reasons for all this stuff. But um, I think that like putting it into production, like when, when people ask me how they can get their developers to care about the things that they care about, right? My number one question is, are they on call? Because <laughs> that's a very quick, easy, blunt solution, right? To making them feel the pain of you or your users. Uh, I think that like a softer version of that is just, you know, kind of what I wrote about in the piece, which is, you know, developing that muscle memory, understanding that your your job is not done when you've merged to master or merged to, you know, trunk and, and you don't get to walk out the door then. Your job is not done until you've watched your code get deployed and you've watched users using it in production. And while you're developing, you should be looking, you should be instrumenting it, right? With an eye to your future self. How is my future self going to be able to understand, is this code working or not? And you should never accept a pull request unless you can look at it and say, I understand how I will know how this code is working in production. And then once your code is out there, even just a canary or whatever, you go and you look at it through the lens of that instrumentation. Is it telling you that your code is doing what you intended it to? And does anything else look weird? And that second part sounds fuzzy and it is, but it is it is not shrinkable from that description. Does anything else look weird? Is, you know, you applying the fuzzy heuristics of your incredibly powerful human brain who knows these systems intimately uh, and knows what you've just done and has the best chance that anyone will ever have of connecting some unintended consequence with what you just did, you know, because you're going to move on to a different problem. All of that context is going to get paged out of your head. You're going to lose it. Like if somebody else discovers it, it could be weeks, months, years down the line after it's, if it's done, God knows what, after it's been absorbed into everyone's expectations of how the system will perform and it's just going to get harder and harder and harder to find it. So how is test-driven development evolving into observability? I like what you say about looking weird because when something looks weird, you're actually observing it. Yes. You're like saying, oh, your mind is saying, I've just made an observation, and the observation is, that looks weird. And it's embedded in the entire complexity of the production system. You know, and like people have tried to like create staging environments that match production. I'm willing to declare that a failed battle. <laughs> it's not that there are not some things that staging is good for. Like, you know, if you're a designer who wants to see how things will display, staging is perfectly, because their production system is actually less the infrastructure, their production system is the browser. It includes the browser, right? And so if you're testing it independent of the browser, you're not, you don't have a production system. So, but like <laughs> production is never going to be staging. Staging is never production. Uh, no one is going willing to pay for production, for a staging to be the same size as production and to be as complex as production. It's always going to be mostly mocked, right? And it's never going to have the same concurrency, the same, like the same impact of millions of users using it, right? in parallel. So I think that it's time to kind of declare that a failure and invest those resources. You know, developer cycles are the scarcest resource that we have. We need to invest those resources into making it so that you have the tooling that you need to ship things in a very controlled and isolated fashion. But it, isn't that what monitoring has always been? And Hasn't that just been the premise behind monitoring? And monitoring not, is post hoc. Monitoring is you're always fighting the last battle. Monitoring is you've got your defining thresholds that say somewhat arbitrarily, 
the system between these parameters is good enough. It's good. It's not good, but always, but it's good enough. It's good enough that we don't have to wake someone up in the middle of the night to fix it. Now, most of the bugs that you ship in your life will never actually trip that threshold. Um, and they can't because you, you will go nuts. There are so many false positives. There are so many blips that you can't explain. That's just part of your reality of running a very complex production system. And if you try and like, you know, Ops teams spend their lives curating these these thresholds, and they're never quite right, right? And, and like the, the the agreement that we have to make with ourselves to run the future distributed systems of the world is you only page someone when your users are impacted. Now, most of the bugs that you are shipping when you're writing code, um, your users won't be impacted, or they won't know that they're impacted. It'll be so subtle, you know. It'll be it'll be something that will be, you know. It's just there are many different kinds of bugs and most of them you will see if you're looking at it, if you're looking for it through your instrumentation, but they're not going to be catastrophic enough for monitoring to catch it. And when I say like the tools we need to build to like shift these things safely and in controlled ways, I'm talking about things like feature flags, right? Like you, I'm not saying deploy everything to 100% of your users in production immediately, right? Like you can have like test users in production that you use, right? Like there are lots of different shades and ways of like shipping things partially, shipping things to a canary if you're worried about the load impact, shipping things in a progressive way. You know, uh, uh, Monk Chips has been talking about this a lot, and I and I and I really love what he has to say. It's all part of the same, you know, the observability tools that let you like break down by high cardinality and high dimensionality. Like they're all part of an ecosystem of extending the reach of developers in very sensitive and like controlled ways into production. I've heard more people talking about progressive software development. And one of the questions I do have is about just those people who have been conditioned to believe in monitoring as the way that they do work. Monitoring Why? isn't going away any more than TDD is going away. They're both like essential characteristics. They're both ex essential tools, but they aren't sensitive tools. They're not sensitive tools. And when you mean by sensitive tools, what do you mean? They're not, um, they are by their nature, like TDD abstracts away all of reality, right? It doesn't let you look for a small, you know, consequence of a small change in a large complex system with all the ripple effects of, you know, the interconnectedness and, and everything. You need to be able to see it in its life, in its native ecosystem, so to speak, not in, in your like very contrived um, false ecosystem, uh, like monitoring, you know, the, the thresholds are, the thresholds are, you know, saying, well, if we get, you know, errors that are more than 0.02% out of, you know, that, that's a, that's a blunt tool, right? Your, your code change might not even result in an error code being thrown. It might be changing suddenly the performance footprint of a query or, you know, the behavior of, you know, a modality or something visually, right? Like they're blunt tools that give you a certain level of confidence in your system. Um, SLOs are better than most monitoring, but, it's fine, uh, but they, but they're, but they're, they're, they're saying above all, this is, this is a heuristic, right? This is a probability. This is a, this is a, this is a very blunt tool that we can use to let us sleep during the nights, but it doesn't actually necessarily tell you anything about the change you just shipped. So in review, we've talked a little bit about test driven development and how it is a muscle memory and how you really need to think about that. Monitoring is something that's been around for a long time and and it has existed a lot in on-premise environments and that's where it really evolved, right? Well, and then, on prem. So yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it all yeah, so it all relates on prem in many ways. So adding all that up, adding that precedent there, why is observability the missing link? It is, is it that, what is it about that fine grained capabilities that comes with observability that makes it much, much more relevant now? Well, um, it's possible now, like storage has gotten cheap enough that you can gather, gather enough detail, right? Um, I would argue that it's always been, it's not so much a missing link as it is a necessary first step. It's kind of like, you know, people are, people are like, People are blind mostly, but they're wearing reading glasses, which allow them to see a fuzzy outline of a shape, right? Which is better than nothing. But like people are like driving down the highway, 
not being able to see very well, which means that a lot of their engineering energy gets sprayed around in the wrong places. And and a lot of problems that they cause don't get caught quickly, right? Like, and, and like observability is like putting on the glasses that are your actual prescription to let you see in very specific detail, you know, letting you break down to the the difference between the specific rows that are exhibiting the error and the the baseline, right? Like there, it's, it's the ability to, um, instead of like, instead of trying to build a sandcastle in the sky in your head to like imagine reading your code and trying to imagine how it's all working and how the, it's interplaying in production, instead of like trying to hold it all in your head, you can literally just look at it in a tool and follow the trail of breadcrumbs. For, for Let me give you an, an, an example. Um, with monitoring tools and, you know, outages and, and like ops and like, you, if you saw a spike in your graph, like a big spike of errors, um, you would, likely look at it, an alarm, try to like remember if anything had just been done recently. Uh, you might like start flipping through other dashboards to see if you see the spike in any of the others, you know, and you're just trying to form a guesses about what's happening, right? It's likely informed by you have a large library of past outages in your head, right? Things that have broken before, things are most likely to be wrong, you know, then you go and you look for those things. Um, which is not really scientific debugging so much as like it's, it's heuristics, it's very human, it's very rooted in the past. And it's less and less useful and helpful today because things, you don't have monolithic systems failing in the same predictable ways over and over. You have these complex microservices, distributed systems where it's a new thing every goddamn time and it's really annoying, right? Your, your outage of past libraries, your library of past outages is not as useful to you when it is comes to interpreting the spike. So nowadays, with, if you have observability, you see that big spike, you might go, oh crap, let me let me go and look at it. Um, you know, and like we have a thing in Honeycomb that is called Bubble Up that will let you do all this just sort of automatically at a glance. But if, if you're doing it step by step, you might just go, uh, there's a big spike. What is it? You know, break down by endpoint. Is it all of the endpoints? Uh, no, it looks like it's just the read endpoints. Okay. Um, is it all of the read endpoints? Uh, no, it's just the ones that talk to memcache and MySQL. Is it all of them? Uh, no, it's just the ones with the primaries that are in this availability, availability zones. Is it, is it all of them? No, it's just the ones with this type of hardware. Is, is it all of them? You know, it, no, it's just the ones where it's running this particular version. It's only, you know, memcache and not MySQL. Um, so is it all of them? Is it, you know, oh, no, it's just the clients that are running this for, you know, so, so you're, you don't have to have any knowledge of where you're going to end up because you yeah. can just put one foot in front of the other and follow the breadcrumb of clues where it leads you to the, to the solution every time, even if you've never seen that problem before, because you have the ability to like, um, you know, at a very low level, you know, it's based in a different building block instead of metrics where, you know, it fires off hundreds of metrics while it's executing, but they're not connected by anything. Instead, there's a thick, thick connective tissue of the request that all the data is aggregated around. Um, and you can break down by high cardinality dimensions. You can string many of them together in high dimensionality queries. Um, and you can just string together these incredibly complex and detailed. And so you can say, oh, these rows are the ones that are failing. And these are all of the things that they have in common. It speaks to the dimensions of space and time in a much different way yes. where there are unknown unknowns. Yes. And how do you observe what is unknown to uncover what's deep, what's really invisible? And so the, the, don't the, even know. the trick is to just like throw it anytime you see a detail you think might be interesting at some point, anything about your environment, anything, the parameters that are passed, anything, you just toss it in there because there's, it's almost free. Like instead of like incurring a, a cost linearly, like it, it's almost free to append more detail to the existing rows. Uh, so you, you, you incentivize developers to capture everything they think might possibly be interesting. Um, so that, so that it's there in the distant future when they've forgotten about it. And it turns out to be that one thing that is the missing link. And so that really defines observability, doesn't it? I mean, it it's does. really about that discovery that yeah. you made. But. Um, I would I would point out that this is a socio-technical system, right? It's not just computers. It's not just people. <laughs> it is people and computers and the tools that they use to manage them. It's a socio-technical system. It's a socio-technical problem, and it will be a socio-technical solution, right? It's not enough. To, you, you don't just buy an observability tool and bingo, it's fixed. It's about, you know, 
making it so that you're welcoming developers into production. Like Ops has this long and deserved reputation for masochism and for being kind of assholes about things. And you can understand why we were assholes because we were trying to keep these systems up with very few tools and like developers are just breaking shit all the time. Okay. Well, these days, like you literally, you you have very low hope of ever debugging and understanding your system if you didn't build it, um, if you're not in there changing it. If and 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 so like as ops people, it's our job to like welcome developers in. You know, our 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 job has pivoted into one of more of services, like empowering engineers to own their own code in production. Um, because like if you aren't in there looking at it every day, you're not gonna know when something looks weird. And you really have to build up, like you said, that muscle, that intuition, and that like that familiarity, that deep familiarity with your complex system. So when you come into the actual reality of it and building out those technical architectures, how can anyone build a robust technical architecture that provides an observability driven approach you start with observability from day one because you know while it's it's never too late um it's always easier uh the earlier you start you will you will move faster and with more confidence when you can see what you were doing and when you make that part of your daily practice um beyond that like the the answer is the same as it's always been there's some things you can learn from past mistakes past principles, um, but every system is unique and you build it step by step, day by day. I would I would say that for technical leaders who are looking at where to start to, to tr try and bring their teams into like the modern era, look at the Dora report and the four metrics. Um, measure your team. Like just the act of measuring something and making it visible and prominent, people will start to bend their behavior towards making those metrics better. And the, the better those metrics get, the, their metrics like you know, time, between when you write the code and when it goes into production, time to recover from outages, um, so forth, um, the better your metrics get, the more time you've reclaimed. And it can turn into this beautiful virtuous, virtuous circle where the more time you reclaim from technical debt, and like babysitting your systems and like, you know, the, the drudgery of like shipping code, the more time you reclaim, the more time you, you have to invest on in reclaiming more time. And it's, you know, in, in computers, like, if you're standing still, you're losing ground, and you can't you can't afford to be losing ground because we need to be doing m more with less every year. That's our, the the scale the growth of our systems demands it, and it's and it's a fun set of problems. So Honeycomb specializes in helping people get there, and you are counsel to people, and you're citing the Dora report, which is very uh, helpful. But how does Honeycomb help people get there? We have uh, one of what I would say is one of only two observability tools available on the market today. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate that everyone's just jumping on the bandwagon going, we do observability because they don't. <laughs> um, and there is a big technical difference. Um, but like what we provide, what we do, like it's, it's kind of, it's funny, like it, I think our customers have more credibility when they talk about this than I do because everybody, every founder loves their ugly baby so hard. <laughs> and I love my ugly baby. Uh, but, you know, you know, our, our, our customers tell us that they, they're able to like delete 90% of their paging alerts when they move from a blunt monitoring approach to a SLO guided approach where they can, you know, where their pain is aligned with their customer's pain. Uh, we we provide tooling that lets developers see you know the impact of their code as they're releasing it which incentivizes them to look harder while they're releasing it you know there's nothing more frustrating than putting the energy in to look for something and and not being able to like find your answer uh and and like i i feel like what we give is is the parenting tools for developers to really own and parent their code in production i like that the parenting tools that allows them to use these capabilities in production. And I do hear a lot about observability. I hear people talking about their observability capabilities. What is it that is different about the way that, you know, for instance, a traditional monitoring technology company might approach observability versus an approach that you're talking about? Yeah, well, it's it's funny because you know there are logs logs and 
there, there are logging companies, there are monitoring and metrics companies, there are APM companies, and they're all kind of trying to race um, in their product to look exactly like Honeycomb looks today. Like that's where they're trying to get to faster than we can build up our business size to look like they look today. So it's a fun arms race, right? Um, at an implementation level, like part of it is about how you gather the data. It needs to be aggregated around that that request, um, not split up into like hundreds of metrics that you can't then correlate or connect together. Um, so like, you know, the, when you when your request enters a, a service, we initialize an empty Honeycomb event, we pre-populate it with everything we know or can infer about it, and then you can stuff anything you think is valuable while it's executing, and then at the end when it's ready to exit or error, it fires it off to us in this one arbitrarily wide structured data blob. Um, usually a materially instrumented service will have like 300 or 400 dimensions per every request. Uh, and then part of the, so that's part of the secret sauce too, is it's stored in these arbitrarily wide structured data blobs. And this gives you like just this really rich power to like, um, you know, query very quickly. Like our 90th percentile query time is like under a second so that you can, you can see how you can just query very quickly and put one foot in front of the other and go, oh, but this and this and this and this, instead of like firing off a query, hoping it was indexed on the right things and then like going to the bathroom or getting a drink, right? Like that breaks your flow, that breaks your debugging. Um, it, so, so part of it's about the speed, part of it's how you gather the data, part of it's how you store the data. But like, and like, I've written a bunch of blog posts about what defines observability and people can find them out there if they're curious. Um, and that points very, in very rich detail to the difference between us and others. But observability is, you know, at the end of the day, an emergent socio-technical uh, property. And if your teams aren't using it, you don't have observability, right? So, so part of it's about the usability and the friendliness too. Uh, you, you know, I've talked about, you know, ops teams. You know, we need to like get over letting production engineers into production, and then engineers need to redevelop their sense of curiosity for how their code is actually functioning. And this isn't usually hard, right? Like it's been drummed out of many software engineers, like to to not like go look at production because there will be dragons. Uh, but like we got into engineering because we're curious people and because we loved it and everybody loves to do a good job, right? And and I feel like it's very easy to motivate engineers to care again if you give them the tools to actually see the consequences and the effects of what they're doing in production. So, you know, it it's partly a tooling thing. It's partly a social best practices thing. It's partly a, a the will to do it thing. But I, I do think that the outcomes become it becomes less and less possible to build and interact with your complex complex systems every year without it so it makes me think of just how we live every day and for instance now it's a time of pandemic and you have to establish routines for yourself mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't just get defeated by it or yeah. defeated by yourself really yeah. We talk a lot about muscle memory and the discipline of just being able to set a routine, set a set a process and set a almost just, you know, your own workflow. Yeah, yeah. The best engineers I've ever worked with all, you know, and this is why I started Honeycombs after, you know, being at Facebook at a parse and, you know, leaving and just going oh shit, I don't know how to engineer anymore without some of these tools. You know, the best engineers I ever worked with were ones that would keep, you know, two buffers open, one with their code and one with, you know, the tooling where they were watching it run in production. And every day they'd be in there. They'd be, you know, poking through, you know, looking at the stuff that they were doing. Well, we've tried to do this in Honeycomb too by letting, you know, people uh, put little triggers on queries. So if you're working on an endpoint or, you know, a data storage or something, you can put, you can just, be like ping me in slack during the day if something weird happens here or if this user does something funny or you know if i'm trying to reproduce a problem and i can't see it you know i want to know if it happens so like any query that you can compose you can just put a little watch on it uh to poke you because i feel like it's like putting yourself in constant com constant conversation with your code in production while users are using it you know like there just there is no substitute i feel like we kind of have to so yeah like the routines I feel like the, the blunt one is just like, you keep it up. You put it in your eyesight every day. So you're watching the things that you're doing like in, become manifest in production. Um, and it's different, like depending on what kind of engineering you are, but 
that combined with, you know, the muscle memory of, you know, I have, I've merged it to master. This is why I think it's so important for people to automate everything that happens between when you've, when you've merged your code and when it gets deployed to production, all of the tests, all the deployment, everything, if you can get it down so that people can just expect that after they merge within five or 10 minutes, um, their code will be live with no human intervention necessary. Um, I think that people will be shocked at the this changes that it will rot, that will be wrought in your team uh, because that's a short enough amount, amount of time that you, you're not going to lose in your head, right? You go get a drink, you come back, now it's live, you predict it, you would expect it, so you can develop that muscle memory of going to look at it, right? If it's a variable amount of time, if it's hours, if it's days, it's really hard for you to bake in that expectation of, you no, know, after you've merged it, then you go look at it, right? It needs to be this tight, feedback loop um, because looking at it while it's fresh in your mind is the best way that you're ever going to be able to find those those subtle problems. So just in conclusion, what have you worked on yourself to become a better developer? What is it that you build into your practices that you can share with our listeners out there about the ways that you're using observability, the way that you're using these practices you talk about to make yourself better every day. And then how do you impart that upon your team? Yeah, one of the most fun things lately has been watching some of the creative uses that we've come up with for tracing. Um, because of the way Honeycomb and Instruments trace it, we're, we're agnostic about, you know, it's just, it's just visualizing things in time, that's it. Uh, and like, you know, so we've instrumented our build pipeline as a trace so we can see which tests are slow, right? Um, sometimes people, you know, our customers will instrument, you know, particular, you know, things from end to end that they're interested in. And it's, it's just the number of uses that have come up for, for like tracing uh, is, is super fun to watch. Mm. You get people hooked on this. Like we love solving problems, right? And you give engineers a power tool and it's not hard to get them off and running. <laughs> but how has that visual representation helped you then? Like what is it what is it uh, to work? It's, be it's because, you know, so I come from ops more than from the development side. And right. and the visual representation for me has been so powerful because I always think I know what what's out there. But often I am surprised and <laughs> and and forcing yourself to get used to like relying on the tool as your source of truth instead of your he head as a source of truth is amazing. It, it is it is it is so good for you and your team because what it does is it pulls all the things that I know, all the things that I'm an expert in out of my head and into a place where everyone has equal access to them. If someone wants to know how I debugged that query last time I was on call. They can go and look at how I did it, right? So they don't have to wake me up in the middle of the night. Or if I'm like wondering how, you know, Christine did something that she's an expert in, I don't have to wake her up. I just break down, oh, I, you know, last time Christine was on call, like two weeks ago, it was like, you know, 2 p.m. on a Thursday. What was she doing? You know, I can like retrieve what was in her brain and try it myself. And I feel like this is, you know, we have never built for individuals. We build for teams because when you're building these large distributed systems, and it, Part of it is locked up in your head, the part that you're building, you know, intimately, but you're responsible for the whole thing. And all the other parts are locked up in other people's heads, right? And so like, and so building a way for you to pull that out of each of your heads and do what you do best and let other people rely on the stuff that you do, like, because it's in a tool where you can look at it is a game changer. Well, that's a perfect way to end this show, I think, is thinking about that game changer and the way that you think about your own work and the tracing capabilities and how that allows you to really see the work of your coworkers as well, which really is critical now in these systems that are so distributed, yeah. so complex and just full of unknown unknowns. Yep. Good summary. Charity, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. Honeycomb provides observability for all software engineering teams to learn, debug, and improve production systems to delight end users and eliminate toil. With Honeycomb, developers code with confidence, operator efficiency goes up, life quality improves, and the business grows.